Salvis is in the building. <laughs> Sal told me that that's the Honda, the Honda song where they sing about all being in one accord. I don't know. If <laughs> well, last night we had 11 people here from shore, and that is the last night that they're going to be coming here until the fall. And once again, I'd like to thank everybody that participated in cooking for them and helping them and stuff like that. I think it's just phenomenal. It's a great outreach program, and... and giving them a place to sleep during the winter and stuff like that. So I'd like to give you a hand for everybody that participated in that. Thank you. A lot happening in the near future. We have the sign up out there for man camp. <laughs> if you haven't been to man camp, you're missing a really good time. It is a lot of fun. We do have a good time up there. And it's right here in Megalia. So like a lot of, a lot of times, like I actually worked that Saturday. So, you know, I'll come up Friday night, spend Friday night, work Saturday, and come back Saturday night. And we have all kinds of good stuff. A lot of good singing from Dave and, and uh, Nathan and stuff. They sing out there. It's a lot of fun and archery. Men's Breakfast sign up on the, th it's the 3rd of May. Also a good time. If you've never been to one, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. It's here at the church. And it's a good turnout. It's a good opportunity to get to know some of the guys that are in the church that you just, you know, you meet and greet, but you really don't get to talk to them very long, so it's pretty cool. Um, May 10th is the hiking ministry, and they're going up to um, Feather Falls, and it should be a really good hike. I kind of refer to it as the rattlesnake roundup. Um, but if you, there's a sign-up out there for that if you're interested. That should be a lot of fun. I'm not so sure I'm going to do it. Anyway, and this fall, we're going to have a woman's retreat. It's the first time we've had a woman's retreat in years so 
please feel free to sign up for it. You guys got to learn to pound your chest. If you're going to, you know, this stuff doesn't cut it. Uh, anyway, in two weeks here at the church, 10, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to have a showing of War Horse. And it's free, of course. And we'll have popcorn and stuff like that. And I've never seen a movie, but I've heard it's very good. They, it's really good. And they speak in funny accents and stuff. But we can work through that. May 17th is coming up. What's May 17th? There it is. Anyway, he said he'd have that up there. Um, we have a, a, a gal, Jeannie Kashner. I don't see. I think she's first service. She's left already. But for the last nine Rock the Ridges, she's made a point of going to almost every place in town trying to collect stuff that goes into the raffle. The things that go to the raffle, that's where we make the most amount of money on Rock the Ridge. And as you know, we do not keep even a dime of that money. It all goes to whoever we're supporting that time. So, but it's, it's sometimes it's overwhelming for her, the amount of work that she has to do. So please, if you can, if you've got any new items that you'd like to contribute, uh, or if you have uh, a friend that has a business that would like to contribute some new items, or if you have some antiques, that's the kind of stuff that goes real well, too, on a raffle. Please let Jeannie know that you're going to help or whatever, or just plain bring the stuff in, and I'll make sure that Jeannie gets it. But it's it's the big function of the event, you know, that uh, where most of the money's made, and it's nice to be able to, as a church, as an outreach, to give away two or $3,000 to these other organizations. So... The sign-up sheets are out there for the Rock the Ridge. And as Nancy's pointing out always to me, don't forget to bring your any perishables, non-perishable food items and put them in the green, <coughs> green bags out there. And they go into a community food bank so that we can uh, uh, help be support there. You know, being part of a church that's prospering, God helps us prosper. But I think that he helps us prosper because we do give and we give back to the community and stuff like that. Now, next Sunday, anybody have any lunch plans for next Sunday? Cancel them. Next Sunday is the uh, youth money thing. They're going to have a, Juan is going to bring just copious amounts of Mexican food. And if you've had Juan's Mexican food before, you know, the guy had put mijos out of business if he really went into it. <laughs> anyway. It's $10 a plate, and what they're doing is they're raising money for the, the kids that are going to a revival thing down at Six Flags, I guess it is. Six, is it Six Flags? Where is it? Six Flags. And they are having something there, a youth musical Christian thing. So it is Christian. And so it, it's going to cost 10 bucks a plate, and that buys a kid a trip down. Now, we'd like to sell enough plates so we can bring them back as well. <laughs> so... Right, of, most of them, not all of them, you know. <laughs> Anyways, next Sunday is Youth Sunday, and they'll be here and, and serving you, and, and they'll be here doing the communion plates and everything else. So please try and come next Sunday and plan on staying for lunch for 10 bucks a plate. I promise you, you won't walk away hungry, and the kids will be out there. It's good to see young people working, you know. We don't see it that much, you know, but that's nice. Anyways, take a moment to greet somebody that you don't know.
how they changed everything around. Today I found myself after searching all these years, and the man that I saw wasn't at all who I thought he'd be. I was lost and you found me here, and I was broken.
you 
today we begin a new series called Alive. And our first part of this series is about the fact that in Christ we are born again. God loves us so much, he sent his son to free us of our sins and mistakes, to give us a new beginning. We are born again because of what he did at the cross and the resurrection. And as we take communion, we remember that no matter what we have been through, Jesus gave his body and blood so that we can be made new.
Thank you. 
Yeah, let's give it up. Hope Rising, the most dangerous worship band on the West Coast. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Hey, Hope Church Second Service, are you glad to be here today? Yeah. Amen. We welcome you. Also, if you're uh, watching online, thanks for tuning in and joining us in our worship celebration. Some of you have heard me talk about our dog, Bassa. Bassa is uh, a little terrier. <laughs> Bassa in Zambia, it means uh, buddy, and uh, our daughter Brittany gave her that name. And uh, I always uh, made fun of little dogs. We always had big dogs. I had a boxer last, and, and uh, then I got this little girl, and she is fierce. And uh, she's caught me a few things about little dogs. Anyway, Monday, uh, after an incredible Easter, Tracy and I decided to have a celebration, a barbecue post-Easter celebration. I'm kind of like falling a little huge to-do list leading up to Easter, and so it was fun. And so what I do when I barbecue is what I've done for years, it's what my dad did, is we barbecue too much, basically, and uh, we had a lot of kids, and there's always kids coming over, so that helped out. But what we do is we'll put a, several things on there and then just kind of feed on it throughout the week, you know, with a little extra here and there. But So I had some chicken, and I had some turkey sausage, and then I found this one great ribeye steak. You know, I always, I always shop at that clearance section at Safeway, you know, and you get it like 50% off. It's awesome. And uh, so uh, what I did is I got the chicken going and uh, then the sausage. And I, I, I was going to wait a little bit and then heat up one side really hot and throw that steak on there, right? So it came time for the steak and I'd had it on the table. And uh, so I turned around and that raw ribeye was gone. <laughs> And Basa was gone, and she took that ribeye and ate the whole thing. And uh, then later that night, you think she's full, right? She's out, and uh, I'm, I, had, uh, I had the headphones on, I was listening to music really loud. Tracy gave me a gift of headphones. It was a gift for me, right? And uh, so I uh, had the music real loud, and all of a sudden I start hearing this kind of high-pitched scream while I'm listening to this song. Is that enough music? And then I look up, and there's my wife upstairs going, ah! Because Bossa had run in, jumped on the bed, and she had a critter in her mouth. And uh, so I go, Bossa! And she comes down, and I could see these little white or pink feet sticking out. I don't know if it was a mole or a rat or some kind of rodent. And I go, Bossa, give me that. And she looks up right in the eyes, and she goes, mm -hmm, and swallows it. It was so gross, you know. This thing, she can run at least 20 miles an hour along a quad. She'll run as far as you want to go. She's jumping. She literally bounces off the wall sometimes when you let her in the house. When I get home, it's so cool. And uh, what I always think about when I watch her is that God put this spirit in her to just go for it. You know, this incredible spirit. And uh, some of us don't know, or we used to uh, know, that life was exciting and something to wonder at. We were born with it. We, we, uh, we had this awe in life and all these questions. We were like little Ayla, you know. We were just full of spirit. Uh, but then sometimes we get beat up in life, and, so, and, and we, we quit living. We quit really living. We kind of move into existing mode. And what I wanted to do with this series following up on Easter is talk about how the resurrection helps us have the power to keep living all of our life, to live life to the full. There is power that's available, and in the weeks ahead, we're going to look at that word power as it's used in the text. Today, I wanted to kind of open up the series talking about this, these words born again that Jesus uses in John 3. It's on the back of your bulletin if you have one, or Howard will have it up here. But in John 1, in John 3, verse 1, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now, who are the Pharisees? I don't know. You're, the, you're teaching. Tell us. No. Uh, <laughs> there was, it was a sect of the Jewish faith. And they were seen as experts, the lawyers, the scribes. You had uh, also the Sadducees. And uh, Sadducees didn't believe in life after this life, so they were sad, you see. And uh, <laughs> the Pharisees weren't fair. They were legalists. And so that's how I remembered in Bible school the difference. But Pharisees were real, real strict and separatist. You know, it was kind of the mindset, only you and I are going to heaven, but I'm not sure about you, you know. <laughs> and uh, so... They're uh, angry with Jesus. So, so why does Nicodemus come to him by night? Yeah. 
Yeah, peer pressure. He doesn't want his buddies to see him. Sometimes people are afraid to check out uh, Jesus or, or the whole church thing because of what their friends will say or their family will say. Uh, and, and, but Nicodemus, there's something about that Jesus. He's got to go check him out. In fact, he makes this statement that, that John records, uh, I think, on purpose, of course, that no one can do the things that he does unless God be with him. He's a teacher come from God, according to Nicodemus. So he, he makes this compliment to Jesus. You know, and you must be a teacher come from God, for no one can do the things you're doing except God be with him. Right about then, if someone had said that to me, I'd have said, oh, really, which one of my messages did you hear? You know, and uh, thanks for the compliment. But Jesus doesn't do that. In fact, look what Jesus does, how he replies to him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Now, right about there, when I first read that, I thought, Jesus, are you changing the subject? Sometimes Jesus does that, you know, or he'll answer a question with a question. And he, and, and, and Nicodemus is saying, you must be the one. Jesus knew what Nicodemus was thinking. Because for centuries they had looked forward to the coming of Messiah who would bring a kingdom that would be an everlasting kingdom like Daniel wrote about. And so Jesus, who knows what's in man, in fact the previous chapter says that statement, he knew what was in someone's heart. He knows Nicodemus is, is thinking, are you the one? Are you the one? And so he's saying to him, yeah, and you got to be born again. I know what you're after, and you got to be born again if you want to see the kingdom of God. Then he continues on. Um, how can a man be born when he's old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. He's thinking physical, isn't he? And you find that reoccurring in the book of John, where Jesus will make a statement like, eat my flesh, drink my blood. They're like, what? Is he talking about cannibalism? But he's talking about take me into, just as you crave food and water, you need to take me into your life. And uh, he talks about the temple being raised and, and his meaning his body, and they're thinking, you know how long it took to build this physical temple? They're thinking physical. He's talking spiritual. Nicodemus, thinking physical. How can a man be born again when he's old till he enters his mother's womb a second time? And so uh, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows Wherever it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Interesting statements. You have John who uses a lot of reoccurring words, which I believe the Holy Spirit is leading him to make emphasis to us. You must be born again. You must be born again. Some translations show that it can be born from above. Uh, John 1 talks about when you were born again, when you put your faith in Christ, you were born a son or a daughter of God, born from above. So he has this explanation, and he says born of water and spirit. And when you Google what does water and spirit mean, John 3, 5, you'll find found up to nine different explanations. Some believe that he's talking about baptism. At the end of the chapter, Jesus is baptizing and uh, we know that Jesus himself was baptized. We know that he said in Matthew 28, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and I'm with you always to the very end of the age. We know when the church began, Acts 2, when Peter preached the first sermon, he says, let each of you repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will see the gift of the Spirit. So, and then you read, uh, every time someone becomes a believer through Acts, sometimes at midnight, the jailer and all his household, they're baptized, they put their faith. Now, I don't believe water saves us. It's only he who saves us. But you do see uh, the em emphasis on water a lot uh, in the New Testament. N the, Titus 3.5 uh, says that he saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 5, 26 and 27, Paul said, talking about Christ dying for the church, he says, to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Um, God wants husbands to lay down their life for their wives and help them be radiant. And Jesus modeled that. And uh, the church should be radiant because of Christ. The church should be alive because of what he's done for us. And so you have this word water used a lot. 
And uh, a- another theory is it's not baptism, but it's talking about physical birth. Like you've heard the phrase, her water broke. You know, so he's talking about you're born of the flesh and you're born of the spirit, which fits in the subject. But a lot of the language experts says it doesn't make sense because of the way Jesus says you must be born of water and of spirit. Something you have to be doing. You're already born. Another theory is uh, that it's water is used to refer to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Um, like in, in this same book, Jesus will talk about whoever has the Holy Spirit in them. Streams of living water will flow from within. And the Old Testament talked about that metaphor a lot. So I'm not going to go through all the different theories. Here's what I believe with all my heart. The right one is, I don't know. Uh, I, it doesn't hurt a thing because we still baptize. We don't believe that saves us. We believe God saves us. Jesus saves us. Faith in him, right? But we follow that pattern. We believe the Holy Spirit is given to every believer, and then he bears fruit in our life. See how he says the wind? You can't see it, but you see its effects. When you see love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, you see the effects of the Spirit of someone who's alive and been born again. Then uh, Peter writes about um, something that I wanted to share with you. He's mentioning baptism in the subject, and uh, he'd been talking about Noah and how only eight were saved by water. That is, those in the ark, of course. And then he says, this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By what? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Everyone's in submission to him. Angels and authorities and powers. And he says, it's an answer of a good conscience. So it's not the cleansing of the filth from the flesh. It's not taking a bath that does it. If that worked, we could just like drag people off the street, pull them in here. Whoosh, yeah, you know, uh, but it's an answer of a good conscience toward God. I, and I don't know what all that means, but I think part of it is you, when you trust in God to save you, your conscience is clear. No matter what you've done, you've made mistakes. We all do. We all goof up. But we can lay our head on our pillow at night and say, God, I thank you. I know there's sins I did today. There's probably there's sins I don't even know I did. There's things that good things I should have done I didn't do. But I thank you that my salvation, my being right with you, is not based on what I do, but what you did at the cross. And I'm trusting in that. It's my only hope. And if you don't have a clean conscience with God, you need to change that. You need to trust in what he did and not what you did. And you need to Trust in his grace. That's our only hope. And works are an outgrowth because of grace, not to earn his salva- our salvation. So you need a clear conscience. When I uh, had my grandson Ryder with me when he was two and a half, he uh, loved to go see the horses. First place he always wanted to go to was uh, this barnyard. He'd say, barnyard. So he'd go to the barnyard, and he knew all the horses, and that's Mida Quinn, and he knew my name, and the people that cared for him were real nice to us, and they'd say, hi, Ryder, and talk to him. And then we'd pull out of the barnyard, and he'd say, two donkeys. Because down the road, there was two donkeys. So we'd go see those two donkeys and look at them. And then we'd pull out of there, and he'd go, hill, hill. Because up on the hill, he knew there was more horses, and there's some alpaca there, and uh, some uh, sheep and stuff's really cool. So we'd go up there, come down the hill, and he'd say, other horses, other horses. Because there's another ranch a little farther out, so we would go see them, and he'd see sunshine and know him by name and talk to them. And then we'd pull out of there, and he would go, again. <laughs> Which meant go to all of them again, again. There are some days I went three times in that whole... <laughs> thing and he's finally fallen asleep he found that was one of his first words again if he found something he liked you just throw that again out you get a do-over and maybe today there's someone here that's beaten up and feel like their life is over and you need to hear from jesus that you can be born again you get a do-over you get made new and you're born from above you were made to live forever You weren't made to die. When Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, death died. 
and, and you and I are given the freedom, the ability to live forever. And sadly, we, we're attacked and we go through struggles and we can be tempted to stop living before our physical body dies, and that's not God's plan. Notice what Paul says in Romans 6. He says, Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was what? Raised. Raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live what? A new life. If we've been united with him in, in the likeness of his death, we will certainly be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. So it's a picture. Baptism is a picture. Uh, you, 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 you're buried you rise, and it's because of what he's done for us. We trust in him when we put faith in him. Um, someday, someday that my little dog is probably going to die before me, but maybe not. You never know. But uh, it's always sad when our pets die, right? And, and I got to go bury him, you know. And we had a dog named Brutus once, 60-plus pound uh, boxer. And Brutus was like one of the kids, and uh, Brutus died and uh, I found out for 50 bucks I could do a communal burial at this vet place. So I was driving there. And I got him in the trunk. Zach had spent the night with him the night before. We were all torn up and sad. And I thought, Brutus was too good to be buried in a communal burial. I will find a place. And I'm, I'm texting. Sorry, Will, I'm texting. But I think it was before it was illegal. But anyway, <laughs> my kids are like, uh, way to go, Dad. Way to go. Find a good spot. And so... I drove up, and there's this reservoir on the way to Santa Cruz, the Santa Cruz Mountains outside of Los Gatos, and a real beautiful spot, uh, illegal place to do this, by the way. So I go in there, and I, I feel like Tony Soprano. I've got, like, this big body and a shovel, and, uh, and I'm digging this spot, and then a helicopter goes over, and I've, like, got a red shirt on, of course, duh. and I was like, oh, man, and I got him a good spot overlooking uh, the water, and every time we would go to the beach, we would all say, to Brutus, and... Uh, so why, why did I do that? Why did I bury him? Because he died. He's dead. Your old life before you come to Christ is dead. And your old thought pattern, your old mistakes, things that were done to you, they need to be buried with Christ. Now, sometimes they come back up, right? So we have to be renewed in our thinking. That's why I'm going through these scriptures, because we have to be renewed in our mind. Romans 12, 1. God works in us, in our hearts, to create a positive spirit and take away the negative, and we have to be buried with Christ. And then we rise in a new life. Uh, Howard, a few weeks ago, talked about that verse in Luke, where it talks about uh, dying. On, uh, following Jesus means that we have to uh, take up our cross. What was the cross for? A cross was for like pretty jewelry, right? Uh, stained glass windows. A cross was, yeah, it was, it was not only for death, but prolonging death and reserved for the worst of criminals. Roman citizens would not be uh, crucified unless uh, of extreme cases of treason. And so uh, when he says, take up your cross and follow me, he's saying, hey, it's time for you to get in a funeral procession, and it's your own. And so... Um, then he says in Luke, Luke says, how often does he say to do that? Like when you first get saved? Daily, daily. So every day I get up and I go, okay, am I going to do what I want to do? Or am I going to do what Jesus wants? And sometimes I get that mixed up. And he'll let me get beat up. And I go, yeah, Stan, get back on the cross. Get back on the cross. It's a lifetime battle that we're in. And being led by the Spirit, which he puts in us, uh, is how we really live and live life to the full, and we can live alive. Now, this just gets better, because check this uh, next one out. Therefore, we do not lose heart. It's not, aren't those beautiful words? This is one of my favorite Bible verses. We do not lose heart. Though outwardly, we are wasting away. That's not the exciting part. <laughs> outwardly, we're decaying, some translations say. Outwardly, we're wasting away, yet inwardly, we are being renewed. How often? Day by day. day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Billions of dollars are made on the flesh industry, right? Right? commercials, magazines, all talk, where we spend so much time worried about the flesh. 
you know, and it's, it's a normal thing. Uh, you know, I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror, and I'm like, oh, I'm not looking that bad. And, and then I put my glasses on, ah! you know, the, 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 the wrinkles and the things that happen in time. Uh, you know, uh, it's just a part of it, but this, the flesh is decaying, and that's not an exciting subject. We don't want to gather together and, hey, let's have some coffee and talk about how we're decaying. How's your rotting coming, you know? <laughs> well, gravity's really getting heavy, you know, it's pulling on me. Um, but, but, but the beautiful part is, although this shell, this outward shell is, is falling apart inwardly, we have found the proverbial fountain of youth. He says in the language in the area, we get better and better and better. We get newer and newer and newer and newer. That is an awesome verse. That's why he says we don't lose heart. And then he, he writes from an eternal perspective. We don't fix our eyes on the physical stuff, but on the unseen. The unseen is what's going to last. What are we tempted to spend more time on in this fallen world? The, what we see, right? And we get... We get all worried about stuff we see or what others do that we see. Or we, and we live in this fleshly kind of, and it's not easy. I understand that because we're human. But God calls you and I to live on a deeper level, uh, to really live, to live life to the full. We have to see things from an eternal perspective. We're going to live forever. I believe that's why those early Christians could march in to a Roman arena, and all they had to do was throw incense and say, Caesar is Lord, and they'd be set free, and they go, no, Jesus is Lord. They had a, a, a gleam in their eye that they believed because of the resurrection, they're going to live forever and ever and ever, and they could not be stopped, and the church kept growing. And you were created to live forever, and I was created to live forever. And one of the challenges is we go through difficult times, and we, st we can be tempted to stop living. D difficult times is part of the process of the test for us to really, really live because it comes with the territory, right? I love that we sang You Won't, you Won't Reel In. It's one of my favorite songs. And I believe it, it's so true. The longer I try to follow Jesus, it's so true of the Christian life because he's going to let you and I go through some stuff, some mud. And we can either go... We'll bag this, God, if I have to deal with this and take our ball and go home. Or we can understand that he's got faith in us and he's working in us and he's burning off the dross and he's, he's, he wants it all. He wants it all. And that's the challenge to live really fully alive, to live all our life. Last week, I came up here second service and I usually sit right around here and there was no seat. And so I, I walked up here and I sat on the floor behind Kit. We had the congas over there and I was peeking through the drums at you guys. And I, and I knew, I'd just been told we had 310. And I was just like going, wow, this place is alive. Living things grow. I never had to tell my kids, okay, I want you to grow. Sit there and grow, would you? <laughs> you know, you give them food, you give them water, but living things grow. God makes living things grow. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, one man plants, another waters, but only God makes things grow. So when I see us growing like we're growing, I am so humbled by that. We're alive. You know, this week, someone at a place called Hope Center gave clothes to two of our members because they heard about what we're doing with Blitz. And things just keep happening like that, uh, that because people, God is working and we're alive. And I don't want to lose it, do you? I want to stay alive. And the way we stay alive is trusting in God. Only God makes things grow. We do things like we try to do music that we think will appeal or touch the hearts of people that we're trying to reach, the unchurched people on this ridge. You know, people, people listen to music uh, you, that it's changed, right? I mean, you could be in an elevator and hear Led Zeppelin now. TV commercials, you know, play. D deadheads have gray hair or no hair. You know, I mean, times have changed in the people we want to reach. So we try to use music because only lyrics makes it um, Christian. It's only the lyrics. And uh, so that helps. That can help if it helps open some people's hearts. And we want to have practical teaching. And because the word is so practical and people don't know it, and I want so badly to know that it talks about the very same things we struggle with, like anxiety and fear and forgiving others and all of those things. It's so practical. So we try to make it practical. And then we kind of think being friendly ought to help, right? So we should 
probably be friendly, right? That helps. And it was so cool when I first visited here. The, the 40 I met were so friendly. I was like, yes, they're all greeters, you know. But those things alone do not make the church grow. Only God makes the, thing, the, the church grow. And only God can give you a new birth and give me a new birth. And you can get up every day, man, every day get up and say, I want to live. I want to live. And I know people can, can be frustrating and try to take away your joy. Here's what you need to understand. You cannot make everybody happy. In fact, Jesus said, if you're, if you're making everybody happy, there's something wrong. When you try to make everybody happy, what you do is you, you end up upsetting a different group every time. you got to live for an audience of one. You want to love everybody, but you can't please everybody. Also, circumstances are going to happen that can jack you up, that you can say, oh, my life is over. No, it's not. You can still, through the power of the, the empty tomb, you can say, I'm going to live. I'm going to live all the days of my life. I'm going to live fully alive. I will not die and just exist until they stick me in the ground. Because at the end of time, I'm going to be out of here. My spirit, my soul will be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. You were made to live fully alive. You were made to be alive and to be full of, of vibrant joy every day of your life. Now, I know you may be in pain, and, and that doesn't mean you're happy sometimes. Joy is not happiness. Happiness is based on happenings. I get a feeling from a burrito. I get, <laughs> I get a feeling from a piece of pizza. What I'm talking about is you in your mind and in your heart claiming the scriptures that I've been born again. And every time that, li that liar, that Satan who dogs our tracks tells you, See, you can't change. See, you blew it. See, you're too far gone. You're overqualified. You know, we hear that in the world sometimes, right? Your life is done. You just got to claim Scripture and say, tomb empty. And when he reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Tomb empty. Today's the day, if you haven't done it, where you can be born again. You can ask Christ into your heart, and you can say, I surrender, Lord. I want this do-over. I've been looking for a do-over. I didn't know it was possible, and you can be made new. And if you've been struggling, and you've, you're a believer already, but you've just kind of been getting by, today's the day you and I, we can, we can claim the power of the Holy Spirit and go out of here renewed and get better and better and better until we go to be with the Lord forever. Amen? Amen? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this church that is alive, and I thank you that we get to be born again. And... Uh, some of us um, have some real hurts and pains or struggles from our past, things that we were embarrassed by that we did, and we didn't know we could be forgiven and get a new clean slate, and we thank you for that. And that it, it continues on. Even though we still blow it, you keep um, renewing us day by day through faith in Christ. I pray for anyone here, Lord, that's new to you, that wants that resurrection power, that you make yourself known to them, Lord, and that they will become a Christ follower, that they'll be born again and receive your spirit and, and live alive. I pray for those of us that are already believers. And I don't want to put down anybody's pain if there's someone hurting. Um, I don't want to put, make fun of you in any way. I just want you to claim that spirit uh, that you can live with joy in your heart, fully alive all the days of your life, and then go to be with the Lord. You were made to live forever. And uh, we, we celebrate that in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand and worship God. Everybody's got a wound to be healed. I want to believe there's beauty here. Because, oh, I get so tired of holding on. I can't let go. I can't move on. I want to believe there's meaning here. How many times have you heard me cry out, God, please take us? How many times have you given me strength to just keep breathing? Oh, I need you. Yeah. 
wondering how I got to where I am. I'm trying to hear that still small voice. I'm trying to hear above the It's time to pray for our offering. Yeah, let's pray. As we bow to pray for our offering, if um, you're hurting financially, please don't worry about that. Just give God your heart and focus on that. And if you're also visiting, this service is our gift to you. Uh, Father, but I pray those of us who um, are committed to the vision here at Hope will give cheerfully as we prosper and that you will make us a force of hope on the ridge and beyond. We need you and we dare not try to do it without you, God. So please help us, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, before we give, what is our purpose? Building Building relationships that last forever. How do we do that? Love God, love people. Remember, every single day this week, in Christ, we always have hope. Thanks for being here.